I recently had the pleasure of doing another show with Greg Otten, the author and producer of a really good podcast called Maritime Gardening. We discussed a number of timely topics, including different ways to start seeds, some myths about LED lights, how to get seedlings conditioned for planting outdoors, some tricks that allow you to direct seed vegetables and get an earlier crop. We even discussed the myth about planting cucumbers on a hill. I'm sure you'll enjoy this discussion, so I decided to put it all together into this video podcast. It's a new format for this channel, so please let me know what you think in the comments below. You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 76, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Well, folks, today we've got a, a guest back here. We've got Robert Pavlis, author Robert Pavlis. And we're going to talk about uh, transplanting myths and tips. Who is Robert Pavlis? If you have not listened to an episode with Robert Pavlis before, he's the author of the books Garden Myths and Building Natural Ponds. He's a master gardener with over 40 years uh, of experience, uh, owner and developer of uh, Aspen Grove Gardens, a six-acre botanical garden in Guelph, Ontario, a speaker and a teacher on, on the topic of gardening. He's published uh, articles in various publications. Uh, author of widely, uh, the widely read blogs, Garden Myths and GardenFundamentals.com. I actually often frequent Garden Myths and even get into debates on Garden Myths sometimes. Um, and he also has a YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, I've noticed, Robert, you've been fairly busy pumping out content, uh, content this year. Yeah, I've uh, tried to increase the amount of YouTube videos I'm making. And it seems to go on quite well. People they, they, there's no TV shows on gardening, right? So YouTube is your second best thing. That's a so, good point. Yeah, a, a lot of people complain about TV, that there's no gardening on there anymore, and I figured YouTube must be a good substitute. So I'm going to put more effort into that this year. I think it's a, yeah, I mean, that's that's where I go for just for everything. I don't, well, I don't even have cable anymore. Anyway, you seem to be doing good. I mean, you got more subscribers than me, so. <laughs> well. <laughs> I guess we'll have a race, see who, yes, exactly. who climbs fastest. Exactly. Oh, man. So uh, how are you doing this uh, this year? I've noticed, uh, how's the winter been in Guelph? Uh, it's, been, it's been lovely for me because it's cold and we have a fair amount of snow and people are complaining it's one of the worst winters we've had in a long time. And uh, that's great because I have so much stuff to do indoors that I don't really need I don't have time to go outdoors anyways, so I don't feel bad. I've been doing a lot of writing. I uh, oh. finished uh, the second Garden Myths book. Garden Myths 2. Garden Myths 2 was out uh, three or four weeks ago. Oh, okay. Great. And so that's available on uh, Amazon? It's available on Amazon now, yes. The blue, blue version. First one was red. The second one's blue. And uh, we had talked about that last fall, and... Uh, I started it in sort of October-ish and got it published. I worked quite well. And I'm actually writing a fourth book. Oh, so, my goodness. You were, before you were a gardening guru, you, did you have a career as a, what was, what was your, this is sort of like your, your second career, isn't it? Yeah, I was, uh, I was a chemist, biochemist, uh, as far as education goes. And I spent most of my life in marketing, sales, and then I developed a software company and ran it for 25 years. Holy smoke! So, Renaissance uh, man. <laughs> yeah, sold sold the business, retired early, and started a career in writing. Wow, that's that sounds good. That sounds great. That was great to me. The last year we had a, a winter like this was 2015, and that um, that gardening season was the worst vegetable garden I'd ever had. I mean, it still was a piece of garden, but for me, I was just like almost depressed. It was so. Um, so I, I changed the way I go about gardening a lot to sort of compensate for this is exactly that kind of winter. Mm. So we'll see if these little changes I've made are, uh, have any advantage at all or if it'll be another disaster. And if it is a disaster, it'll all be captured on YouTube. Because <laughs> 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 I don't do like the, the before and after one video. I just say, hey, I'm planting this this week. And then, I'm, I'm, you know, three weeks later, hey, look, it's growing. Or, hey, look, it totally failed. <laughs> so it's all out there for, uh, for, for everyone, for the world to see uh, the failures of shit. Oh. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about, um, I, don't, I, just, I just put some content out very recently uh, speaking to how I'm really not that big on 
um, doing transplants indoors for various reasons. I'm not going to get into that, but uh, Robert um, has got a lot of tips, tricks, and myths to bust about uh, seed germination and uh, various aspects of getting transplants going. Are these, is this content, the stuff we're going to talk about today, is this from Garden Miss 1 or Garden Miss 2 or a combination of the two or, or stuff from the blog? Um, well, a lot of it's actually not myths. So we'll throw in a few myths here and there, but a lot of it is just general information that's found in my Garden Fundamentals uh, yes. blog. Right. And I have quite a few YouTube uh, videos on seed germination. So I had an interesting thing happen to me this uh, about two months ago. Uh, I had some seeds germinate. And uh, these were Halicia seeds, which is a tall shrub or small tree. And those had been incubating for five years. Five years. I got them from a friend of mine, and I uh, had about eight seeds, and two of the eight germinated, and they're both grown really well. How were they? And, they I assume they weren't incubating outside. No. And the the, the way I, I start most, now I'm not talking vegetables. I'll, I'll talk about vegetables a little later, but I do those differently. Right. But if I'm germinating perennials, trees, shrubs, grasses, anything like that, most of those seeds I do in what I call the baggie method. What, what and, is that? And I basically take a uh, cellophane little baggie, uh, put in a, a tissue paper, a paper towel, uh, wet it, put the seeds in, seal it up, and then it sits around in whatever conditions are needed. And why I like this, I, I can look in it and see the seeds actually start to germinate. Right. right. And I can very easily move it around. So uh, right now I've got a, a tub of uh, baggies sitting on my desk here that need warm germination. But any that don't germinate by, well, let's say May, first of May, I'll put them into the fridge and give them a cold treatment. For a couple of weeks, right, right, and then bring them out back into the warmth to see if that germinates them. But this uh, like a stratification is what they call it. People think that stratification means cold, and in almost all cases, stratification means cold and wet. Right. So if you buy some seed or you collect seed in your garden, and someone says, "Well, they, those have to be stratified," a lot of people just put them in their fridge, thinking, "Well, if I keep them in there for three months, I've stratified them." But the seeds are dry. And right. so that cold period doesn't actually count. The stratification has to happen with seeds that have absorbed moisture. I like the baggy method for that reason. I, I can have in a very small part of my beer fridge, I, I've got 150, 200 bags of seeds, and they take up no space at all. Also, one more great reason to have a beer fridge. <laughs> Yeah, the, my wife doesn't really like them that much in the main fridge, so they stay downstairs hidden away, so she can't see how many I have. Okay, another, um, another good reason for a beer fridge. These Halicia seeds I, I just germinate. I mean, it took, they were five years, and they were in and out of the fridge I don't know how many times. So I'd bring them out warm, hope they germinate. They didn't, put them back in the cold. And I knew they were very slow germinating, so that's why I would given up on them. But all of the other ways of germinating seeds, you you know, you'd give up. Like if you just put them in a pot and they'd be sitting outside for five years, you'd forget to water them. You, you know, all kinds of things would happen to them. The chance of germination there is, is pretty slim. But this way, it's 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 quite a good system. You can um, monitor it and that sort of thing. Yeah. Sorry, I've got one question. How do you prevent um, uh, mold and, and mildew and stuff like that inside the bag? Well, it's it's kind of interesting. I don't get a lot of mold. I get a little bit sometimes. What I do find, if the seeds are not uh, viable, they will eventually mold up. Right. And in fact, I can say I put 10 seeds in and I might get one that suddenly gets covered in mold. And I know that one's not viable. It's a dead seed. Mm. So I, I take that out. Once a baggie's about a year old, they, they do have mold in them and there's black spots. It looks like the bread mold. Right. But, you know, here's, here's one. It's a clematis. In fact, one of these just germinated yesterday. Clematis take a long time to germinate. It's pretty clean, and it's been in here for 14 months. Holy smokes. It's, I mean, there's a little bit of mold here and there, but not a lot. You'd be surprised at how little mold there is. Right. And I don't really use any sterile conditions to, to put them together. I, you know, they're sitting on my desk, and sometimes I use my fingers and so on. It's mold still not really a problem. What what the me, what's the the medium the like uh, it's a paper towel paper towel it sure. could be 
I actually use a paper towel that I get at uh, home hardware stores because it's a little thicker. It's, it's designed for like a workshop. Oh, for cleaning up. But I use the white ones, not the blue ones, so I can see the seeds easier. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, you could use a kitchen towel, but I find the paper is a lot thinner and tends to fall apart once it's wet, so it's a little harder to work with, but mm -hmm. it would certainly work. You don't this have thing to you're using it. Is it, is it, biodegra is it a biodegradable, uh, or is it like uh, a J Jiffy Jerry, Jerry yeah, bag or whatever? It, it's, it, I think it would be biodegradable. It's made yeah. out of paper, like right, it's a standard okay. paper product, so it okay. wouldn't compost just like a newspaper, say. Just a heavy paper towel. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a thicker paper towel. So that's how I do most uh, seeds. The other way I, I have done it, and I at one point I did quite a bit, is something that's called winter sowing. And that's something that your listeners can do right now. It's actually almost a little too late in some areas. In that case, you can do it next year. And I used to do it during Christmas time when I didn't have anything else to do. And you basically take a milk jug or, or a a two liter pop bottle or any container that's either clear or at least white so that some light goes through. Right. And you cut it in half, put some holes in the bottom for drainage, put some soil in, put your seeds in, tape the, the top back on, and you just put it outside in your garden in the middle of winter. Right. And then you leave it. Right. And you don't know anything. You don't water it. Don't worry about the cold. The snow will get on it. It'll melt. It'll whatever. It goes through a natural spring cycle. Yeah. And what you end up with is really small seedlings. And at first you might think, boy, this isn't working so well. These seedlings are so tiny, but they're really tough seedlings. Right. Whereas when we try to germinate things in the house, we usually don't give them enough light and then they get kind of tall and straggly and, and weak. But this system works really well. The one thing you do have to watch is that once the weather gets nice and you're getting more sun, that you don't cook them in that little greenhouse. Right? So you have to take the cap off or something to make sure it gets ventilation or keep them in a part shade area. So how does it get water in that? Uh... Uh, well, it doesn't really dry out. If you, this you, is the soil you've moistened. You've moistened the soil, oh, right. and because it's 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 a closed system, it doesn't really lose much moisture. Yeah. So between January and let's you know in the, my is my zone five, I'd say April, early April, it's fine. I, once that early April comes, you kind of watch it a bit, and if it dries out, you you give it some water, but you really don't have to do anything to it. And uh, that works great for, for many of the plants. A lot of the annuals that go into the garden, anything that's not tropical, you know, that can take the cold. The seed can handle being frozen. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. wet and frozen, yeah. Wet and frozen. So anything that grows natural in cold climates works. Even things that are from warmer climates are fine, but some tropical things, they, they can't take any cold and, and they will die. Yeah. But it's a really easy system. I have a video, a YouTube video on, on uh, winter sowing, and I have a picture that somebody else gave me. It's, it's this, they have a deck out the back of their house, and they have like 50 milk bottles out there. Holy smokes. And they just, you know, they, the person went a little wild that year, and they just had so many of these things going. But it's, it's a simple way of doing it. And then, of course, the other way is, is in the house. And... Um, you know, you start them uh, as normal. You put them in soil and put, put them under lights. What I don't like about putting them in soil is, is that if I'm working with seed that I don't know and nothing comes up, I don't know if the seed was dead or the seed was okay, but they didn't get the right treatment. You know, maybe mm -hmm. they needed a cold treatment. I didn't give it to them. Maybe they needed to be scarified, which means cutting them a little bit to break right. the outer shell. But I can't see what's going on. They're in the soil, so they're hidden. So I don't really like that. But I do use that method for things like tomatoes, for instance, because I know they germinate and I know they're warm germinators, right? You put them in the soil, give them two weeks, 10 days to two weeks, and they're going to be up. Most indoor vegetables I would do like that, like cucumbers, for instance. I would do right. that. Yeah, I found um, with peppers it's hard to be patient because they seem to take when I used to, When I used to do that, uh, because peppers sometimes take two or three weeks. If you yeah. haven't, uh, you're always like, did I, did, I, did I do something wrong? Did they go bad? You know, and it's you, you sort of want to, you know, you, you, it takes a lot of patience. Oh. Uh, I can't imagine waiting five years for something. To try. Well, <clears throat> try try doing peppers in a in a baggy system. 
yeah, yeah. because you can see if they if they go rotten, you'll see it right away. So how do you if you're doing this baggy trick, how do you get the seedling? So let's say I, I might try this. I'm going to get my I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this because I did a video on on buying seeds of like weeks and weeks and weeks ago. But I I just emailed uh, Bessie's all my the seeds I want this year uh, yesterday. <laughs> so uh, anyway, let's say I, I, I put some peppers in a bag with, with some paper towel. And so now I've got this unbelievably fragile sprout in the bag. What do I do then? It, it's not that fragile, actually. You'd, okay. you'd be surprised. Pepper seeds, for instance, they're huge compared to some of the seeds I deal with. I, uh, I, yeah. I just use some, some tweezers and I take them out one at a time and pot them up. And in fact, that's another reason I like it. If, if you have seed where you only have a few and you want to grow them all, put one seed in a pot. Whereas if you don't pre-germinate them, you have to kind of put two or three in a pot and see what happens. And then they're yep. crowded and you have to separate them or whatever, right? Right, yeah. This, this way, you, I only put one in and I know when I'm putting that seed in the soil, it's germinated because I can see the root on it. Now, when you put it in, do you have to aim it up or anything like that, or just, just put it, you know? Yeah, uh, these they know which way's up and down. I'd make a little uh, hole with pepper seeds are large enough. I'd make a tiny little hole and try to drop it in with the root going down. But if right. it's pointing up, that's okay. It'll, It'll turn figure around. it out. It'll turn around. Yeah. Right. In fact, uh, that was a experiment I've done last couple of years is with bulbs. You know, they always say, well, make sure you plant the bulb the right way up. Bulbs don't care. You can just throw them in the ground and they'll turn themselves around after a couple of years. Really? Yeah, plants plants know which way's up and down. You take your tulips and plant them all upside down, they'll be fine. Yeah, you know, they wouldn't have made it very far if that was they were if they were there if they were that temperamental. I don't think they would have survived uh, a couple of millennia. Uh. Yeah, same with same with seeds. If you've never actually seen them germinate, it's just fun to even do because you you'll see the little radical come out first. It will have no root hairs, and then depending on the seed you're dealing with, sometimes they make quite long roots. Like clematis seed will make quite a long root before any of the, the shoot comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, some like a bean seed, the root comes out one day and the shoot comes out the next day, are almost simultaneous. Mm. And you do want to try to get these seeds out of the baggie before they make a lot of root hairs because the root hairs will, will stick into the paper towel and then, then you do some damage to them. Right. Uh, but those seed, seeds are actually quite, quite a bit tougher than you might think. If you had a, a good biodegradable, you know, if you had something that would break down, could you possibly just cut out the paper towel that the seed was on and stick that in? Yeah, if, I've done that before. Put it into it? Yeah, if I, if I leave them too long and I don't look at them and then they're a little too big, then that's what I'll do. I'll cut the paper and just plant the whole paper with the, the root. I've, I've got to say, you know, I just, I just did like an entire speech on why I don't do anything like this and I'm, I'm intrigued. <laughs> Uh, then I might actually I might try this with the peppers and the tomatoes this year just to get in and that, and that way I don't have to have a, a transplanting operation in my house I just need to have a, a couple bags and a nice you know put them on top of the fridge or whatever until they now do you do this in light or as long as it, it's, it's more a heat thing right depends on the on the plants most vegetables aren't really that fussy but they're fine in the light yeah. but there are some seeds that need darkness to germinate hmm so again, I take those same baggies and they're either in the fridge, which is dark, or I put them in my drawer or my desk, which is dark. <laughs> so I can give them a lighter, dark treatment depending on what they need. Right. I have a question for you. you. You say you don't do the transplanting anymore. So do you take your tomato seeds and plant them directly in the garden? And yeah, I plant them under plastic. Like I plant, plant them uh, either in a cold frame or under a plastic dome. I basically okay. jump start, and and that would be a, a dome that I would have had out either all winter or put out months before. To, so that that soil is usually about a month ahead, and it's a bit of a, it's a microclimate, right? Yeah. Uh, and I find okay. that the uh, they're they're a bit behind the transplants, but because they're never moved, that there's no setback and there's no hardening off. They start off small, but they they catch up fast and they grow real almost like your bottle your your winter sowing type thing because they've they've only ever been outside they don't have that huge adaptation so that's that's the trick um, okay. especially if you don't move them yeah I I found that too if if things germinate outside they're just so much tougher like I I think the the problem is that our eyes 
aren't really good at sensing light. So we, we turn on a light in the house and we think, wow, that, that's really bright. Like that's almost as bright as outside. But our lights are in the order of, you know, maybe 500 lumens, 1,000 lumens, and the sun is 10,000 lumens. Yeah, you're not going to get a sunburn or skin cancer from being indoors uh, in, your, in your office. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we think our lights are bright. But from a plant's perspective, it's actually not a lot of light. They're, they're growing in, you know, very low, low light conditions. But we just perceive it as a lot of light. That would and be then you, t- you, you take these poor guys outside and suddenly they're exposed to huge amounts of light. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, you know, when you read about transplanting, you're supposed to have the, the fluorescent light like an inch above the soil and you move it up an inch every time. You know, it just goes to, speaks to how... Uh, bright it actually needs to be to be even close to what uh, the real sun is like. And transplants, uh, like tomato transplants, when I go and by the time I transplant them, they're, they're usually about a foot tall. Wow. Uh, I have tried starting them early and getting a jump start, and I've pretty much given up on that because you get big plants, but I think they get a real setback when you take them outside. And I find the difference between starting three weeks earlier and doesn't end up with earlier tomatoes. Like you might get a tomato a day or two earlier and it's not really worth it. Yes, yeah, so it's what they call a marginal return. Yeah. 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 Well, the one thing I do is uh, when I do take them out, I rip all the leaves off except the very top ones and then plant them so only the top shows. So when I, my foot tall tomato plants, once they're in the garden, they're only about three inches tall. And are you planting those deep or sideways and sort of bending them up? uh, Usually sideways. Yeah. Because if you go straight down, then the soil is still too cold down there. Yeah, I've I've literally killed my tomatoes by thinking, oh, I'm going to plant them super deep and they're going to get all this water down there, but it's it's like two degrees Celsius. <laughs> yeah, it's that, in early spring, you 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 kind of put them in a trench and you kind of, you know, carefully bend them up a little bit right. so that they're only at a couple inches below the surface of the soil. It's a little warmer there. I kind of like the seedlings in the house because I, I love the smell of tomato plants. <laughs> right, they, right. Yeah, it's a unique sort of smell. Yeah, and, and it's just nice to get plants that playing with in the house that you can't do yet in the garden. So, Yes, uh, that's, that's, I think that's one of the main reasons. Uh, uh, I'm certainly, uh, at this time of the year, especially right now, where we just had a huge dump of snow. And I was even out, I was out in my garden last uh, weekend, I think I filmed this, and the soil in my cold frame is frozen. It's just like, you'd think that that would be thawed, but uh, it's, it's still frozen out there. So um, it's, it's, it's only, I think a couple of my domes, there's like a, a narrow strip of soil where it's not. I got to do another, I've done a video every month of what's frozen and what isn't. <laughs> That's really all I can make a video about right now. <laughs> I mean, to, to give a sense of like uh, how different things were last year. So last year, by this point in time, I'd actually sown spinach under glass in, outside. And it had, it had germinated by the middle of March. Now this year, I'm not even bothering to try. Um, <laughs> it just seems to be more, I just, it doesn't feel like any, you know, like there's that point in March or at some point in the season, you, you, you want to go outside with your pruners and start doing stuff. You just get this feeling like, hey, it's, it's time, right? I do not have that feeling at all. <laughs> you know, whenever I get out there with the pruners and start pruning, it's, that's, oh, that's a, such a wonderful uh, change in the season when you can, you know, oh, I better prune my apple trees and prune this. And just like, to me, that's the beginning of gardening season, that's the pruning. It's, it's nice. So we're going to talk a little bit about lights. Yeah. Uh, I used to grow under fluorescent lights and they, they work fine. I actually grew orchids at one point and I decided to get high intensity lights. So I do have 500 watt sodium lights, which are oh, beautiful. 500 watts. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's actually a fixture with two 500 waters in it. Wow. Um, but I only use one. And the nice thing is they can be three feet, four feet above the plants and the plants get lots of light. So it's more like being in a greenhouse, which makes it really nice for working with your plants. Yeah. But they use a lot of power. They're, <laughs> they're, they're not very efficient. <laughs> but I, I have them now, so that's that's what I'm using. If I was going to get new lights today, I'd get some of the new LED shop lights. Right. And there's lots of people who have reported very good success with them. They're not a lot more expensive than fluorescent shop lights. 
You won't get any of the technical information about the, the lights and so on. You just kind of have to trust them that they're, they're going to work. And they work fine, especially for seedlings and low light plants they'll be fine for. I'm not sure if I'd use them for something like orchids, which tend to be high light required plants. Right. But that's what I would do now. I, I just get a couple of those and, and you, I've seen them available for, you know, $50 around that price range, even a little less easy to install and easy to use. So yeah. you're saying you're saying shop lights and stuff like that. Not uh, what about like the what they call grow lights? Yeah, there are grow lights around. I have what a. Makes, what makes a grow light a grow light? Price. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't get a grow light for fifty dollars. Uh, now you can get some really tiny little lights that people sell for plants, but it's like for one plant, right? Oh. It's is isn't much use. Uh, proper grow lights are going to cost you two to three hundred dollars minimum. Oh, and you, no, you can spend a thousand dollars on a grow light, right? And these are the ones with the the purple and red lights in them. What they call purple, the right. B. They work really well. They're they're quite high intensity. In fact, the intensity is so high on some of them, they will actually burn your seedlings if you lower them too close to the plants. Wow. The efficiency is is quite good. The amount of light they produce is quite high. The problem with most of them is they have a fairly small footprint. So they're about the size of a laptop. And so you put that, you know, two feet above your plants. And you can imagine something that small and the light coming out, you're, you're not going to get many plants under it. You mean the footprint, like the, the, the cone of light only goes out about a foot wide? No, the, 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 actual, the actual light itself is about the size of a laptop or a little smaller. Okay. So it's only... You know, like maybe a foot long by eight inches wide, usually something like that. It's quite small. Right. And the cone of light coming out of that is going to be pretty small too. So it's going to cover an area that's maybe three feet by three feet sort of thing. Right. It's only a couple trays really. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not going to cover much and it's going to cost you two, three hundred dollars. Oh, it's not, it's only really worth it if you're growing something that uh, is uh, illegal to sell. <laughs> not in Canada <laughs> which isn't illegal anymore <laughs> couldn't justify buying those those lights I, I just they just don't me, make a lot of sense to me but they certainly work there's there's no doubt that you can make them work where right. they work really well is is when you have more of a green house area and you put several of them in a row right yeah right. so you have a bank of these things and then right. you can cover a large area but if you're only buying one light I, I think you're better off with the shop lights um, right and price-wise, they're they're hard to beat. Does, uh, how much heat comes off the the uh, the LED? Is can't be is it enough heat to, to warm anything, or is it they're fairly, they don't produce a lot of heat, are they? Well, this this is one of the myths about LEDs. Is uh, one is that they're really efficient. You know, they're hundred percent efficient. Another one is they don't give off a lot of heat. Neither of those is is really true. So now they're for five hundred watts. <laughs> LEDs are more efficient than the old incandescent lights and EM fluorescent lights, but they are not 100% efficient. Uh, if I remember right, they're in a 70% range. So you can't, you can't use that. You can't use energy and be 100% efficient. Some of that's going to yeah. be. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so that's a misconception, and that extra 30% energy turns into heat. Yeah. Yeah. So depending on how the fixture is made, proper LED grow light is designed so the heat is above the lights and, and moves upwards away from the light. And the better units, in fact, have little fans in them because oh, they, really? they get so hot that they actually have to blow the heat away. So LED bulbs will last a long time provided they don't get hot. Right. If, you, if, you, if they get hot, they, they burn out quite quickly. Right. So these things have fans in them. Of course, the fans need electricity too. Yes. So when you're buying a, a light and the light is, you know, let's call it a 100 watt fixture, the 100 watts is the electricity it uses for everything. Oh. And not all of that goes to the light, right? So a good part of that might go to the fans. Yeah. So it's very hard to compare LED lights and say, well, this is a 100 water and this is 150 and 150 is better because the 150 might actually give you more light. 
really depends on the type of bulbs that are in there, the electronics that are in there, the type of fans you have, and, and so on. So right. the wattage is a, is a bit of a guide. Like, you know, 100 is not as good as 1,000. Yeah. But you might have a 200 fixture that's not as good as a 100 fixture. It's only uh, 50%. It could be 100% more watts, it's only 50% more aluminum. So you really have to look at the light output when you're, you're buying those. Right. Now, again, when you buy shop lights, they don't tell you any of that. Like none of, there's, there's no specs there. You don't know what the spectra looks like. You just have to buy them and, you know, they will work. Right. Just, yeah, they, they, it's going to throw out a lot of light and it's, <laughs> it's going to work. Yeah. But there's been lots of people on YouTube and on the internet who who've, who've switched over to them and they work just fine. So I'm pretty confident they will work. Yeah. So I think the next thing we we're going to talk about, our final topic, was uh, planting out. Because that's, that's one of the things I, I found the most frustrating is you, you put all this time and energy into your seedlings and you know, everything's looking fantastic when you're inside. Even when you've done little things like, you know, uh, waved your hand around and then touched them and, and done with all those little, have a little fan going somewhere, all that sort of stuff. And then you put it outside, you have one bad day, you, you go to work and the temperature drops and they're dead or whatever, right? So uh, you had some tips on that. Don't have a problem with any of that because I bu built myself a really expensive sunroom and oh. I just put them in there. <laughs> what I would do with them is uh, take them out and, and you, you have to put them in a shady location. You can't put them somewhere where they're going to get some direct sun during the day because you're not there to watch them. A north side of the house sort of thing. Yeah, mine, mine go out on a, a sort of a northeast side, but they're in a cubby corner where they get very little light, except maybe the first half hour in the morning when it's cool. Yeah. And there's no way they're getting direct light the rest of the day. They'll spend three days there. Right. And then I'll move them out a couple feet away from the house. So they get a little more wind and they get a little more sun. And then every two or three days, I'll move them a little farther. And I find that after about a week, they're pretty good. Oh, so that's a different tech. Uh, that's better than so what I was doing is I put it on the north side for three days, and I put it on the east side for a number of days, and I stick it on the south side, and they vaporize. <laughs> yeah. So I think it takes, takes about a week. Gardeners like to do things with numbers, right? So they, they say, well, how long should I condition them? Because they want a date. Is it seven mm -hmm. days or is it 10 days? And it doesn't work that way. You have to, first of all, figure out how sunny has it been. Yes. If yeah. I put them out one day and we get a real cloudy week, then they haven't been exposed to sun. So it's, I have to wait for some sunny days to get them used to the sun. Yes. Yeah. If the temperature drops, they're not being exposed to warmer temperatures, right? So it's going to take a little longer. So you kind of have to, before you put them in the ground, the seedlings should be getting full sun and the temperature that they're going to have the next week or so after they're in the ground. Right. And you just have to play it by ear and see, see what happens. Sometimes I put them out and three days later, I have to bring them back in again because it's getting too cold. Right. Then I always look at the weather two weeks out. The weather forecasting is getting pretty good online now. I'm not looking for a frost. I'm looking for at least five degrees. My rule of thumb, and again, we're centigrade, but my rule of thumb is I need five degrees above freezing. That's the lower limit because things like tomato plants can be harmed below that. Oh, yeah. But where do you go to get your, your weather information? On? I mean, I just look at Environment Canada, but is there, yeah. that only goes ahead a week sort of thing. Yeah. Do you, I, well, I do weather.ca. Weather.ca? Yeah. And I think, I'm pretty sure there's a weather.com that's pretty right. much the same thing. A week out, it's pretty good. Two right. weeks out is a bit fuzzy. Margin of error there. <laughs> yeah. But if, if I look two weeks out and they're calling for, you know, three days of low temperatures, that's too early to go out. You know, I don't, I don't care. I don't do things by dates. I, you, you got to look at the weather. And I have to look out that the next two weeks have to show that this is going to be above five degrees for me to put them into the garden. I had this idea that if you, because this is something you do as an angler. Um, a lot of things tell you when other things are like you, there's certain, uh, when the peepers start singing is when you can catch, uh, catch uh, smelts in the rivers and 
there's all these things that are timed to other things. Certain things bloom, like the when the strawberries uh, bloom is usually when the sea trout come up the rivers and, and certain things like that. So I thought, you know, most of those plants, they're going to wait. They're not going to, you know, do their thing the first nice day. They're going to wait a certain amount of time. That they're just going to have evolved for that. Like the conditions have to be right for a certain amount of time before they actually start to go into season mode sort of thing. Yeah. All things being equal. I mean, there's years where things, like last year, we had a hard, hard freeze frost that uh, just a lot of things, I mean, like, so, you know, the oak trees had leaves and the, the maple tree, everything had leaves, uh, you know, like the trees even got it wrong that year sort of thing. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's along the lines of what you're suggesting that, you know, it's got nothing to do with dates and numbers of days. It's, it's how is the season going and playing it by ear and just going, you know, like using all the sources of information you could possibly bring to bear on that question and, and making a judgment call and hoping you get it right. Now, the other thing I sometimes do too is I, I split them. So I might say, well, I think I'm going to try for some really early tomatoes this year. Oh, this, so, I, I bet you do that every year. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> could be. But you, what you do is you take, you know, two or three plants and you put them out. And you know that it's risky, but they just might survive and give you an early crop. Yeah. And if you lose them, the majority of your crop is still inside being protected. Yes. Right? That's right. So I do that. And a lot of the vegetables I grow are, are direct seeded. I love sugar snap peas. Yeah. I do that with them too. I'll, I'll plant them really early sometimes. If, you know, if, if, if the snow's gone and, the, and the, there's a bit of drying, I think, geez, you know, they just might make it. I'll plant one row of peas knowing that there's a good chance they won't make it. But if yeah. they do, I have an early crop. Oh, they're crazy tough peas, yeah. The other thing I've done with, with peas, actually, I've started pre-germinating them. It speeds up the process. I, I'm not sure it's really worth it, but peas are really dry when you get them. Mm -hmm. So I always soak them overnight, and I think that helps because they absorb the water. Germination doesn't start until a seed actually absorbs water to a certain extent. It needs a certain amount of moisture inside the seed, and that triggers the chemical reactions to start germination. Right. So by soaking them inside, that helps a lot. Actually, the last couple of years, what I've done is I've soaked them and then I've left them sitting in a bit of water, not completely covered because seeds also need oxygen. Right. But it's sort of half covered and like let them sit like, there. Like they're bathing. <laughs> they're bathing, yeah. Like they're floating with their tummies in the air and their bums in the water. Yeah, yeah. And then I wait till they start germinating. They'll germinate faster because they're in the house and it's warmer. Yes. And then once I see the, the little radicals starting to break through, then I take them out and plant them. And then I get plants much quicker that way. That doesn't make them fragile for uh, extreme cold. If I get extreme cold, then I do it all over again do with all, another yeah. set of peas. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I tend to split my crop anyways. I do some earlier and some later. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, to to spread out the the harvest a little bit. That's right. I have a I have a myth question for you. Do you grow cucumbers? Yeah. Do you hill them up? Like, do you make a hill and plant in the hill? No. No. I just stick them in the ground about to the first knuckle on my thumb, yeah. and that's it. But you've heard about hilling them up, right? Oh yeah. Put them make a hill, plant three seeds in the hill, and then take go you know, take out two of them or whatever. Yeah. When I was younger, I did that all the time because that's what the package said: make a hill, yep. put the seeds in there. I'm pretty sure this is in my Garden Myths book, too. The question comes up is, why do you put them on a hill? Like, why should a hill work? And it's actually kind of interesting. It turns out that the word hill is based on some old Latin or English word that actually meant something completely different. Really? It just meant a community. So what people would do is they would plant three or four seeds in one spot, and then they just let the plants go out in all directions, 360 degrees. It had nothing to do with actually making a mound. Really? So it's a, it's a translation error. Oh, my God. It says that on every seed pack, and you read it everywhere. Yeah. I just didn't do it because it, it, uh, I thought, well, the hill is, if I make a hill, it's not going to have the, the right uh, moisture balance. It's going to dry out faster than the, the base soil sort of thing. But my, my thinking was like, you know, it's, it's going to have more kind of constant moisture if it's at the soil level sort of thing. Why would I put it up even higher and have all that drain out? 
Yeah. Uh, and, and you know what? You're, you're absolutely right. It, in soil that drains well, they're actually too dry on a hill. Mm -hmm. right? So if your soil is very sandy, for instance, yeah. uh, or you're planting later in the season and it's already drying out, they don't actually get enough water. You can't really water a hill very well. No. The water, <laughs> the water runs away, right? Yeah, that's right. So many wells, wells are built on top of the hills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in areas where the soil is very wet and stays wet, the hill is actually an advantage because it warms up faster than the ground around it. And cucumbers need warm soil. Yeah. Hills do work, but if you're going to build a hill, then you should build the hill in the fall so that when the snow melts, it's already there and it warms up very quickly. Right. And then plant in it. Or skip the whole thing and just plant on flat ground. Yeah. So cucumbers is another one that, you know, it needs warmer temperatures. And there's no point in rushing cucumbers. If you put it in a cold soil, they just don't grow very well. But you can start them indoors. They're a little trickier because they're vines and they start clinging to each other and, and they make a real mess. But yeah. as long as you don't make them grow them too big indoors, you, you can get a couple weeks head start on cucumbers. For cucumbers, if, if you just put the plastic on the ground, just a, just a piece of plastic on the ground where they're going to be planted, Let's let's say let's say the uh, the forecast and the last frost date is going to be two weeks from today. Um, you put plastic on the ground, just flat plastic, just weigh it down with some rocks. Two weeks before you think you're going to plant them, just to warm the ground up, right? Yeah. Um, and even that, um, and and then when you even when you sow them, you leave the plastic on for let's say three or four days, and mm -hmm. then you take it off. And then, and then take it off. Yeah. Almost like a baggie, you know, like you're turning your soil. <laughs> Uh, but you got to get it off. Uh, you can't leave it on too long. Or is this... uh, last year, I even tried uh, sprouting some beans and potting them up. Got them making fruit a little earlier. I maybe saved a week. Right. Again, I don't know if it's really worth it, but you know, if you've got the space and the time, why not? Right. Particularly if you're in a colder climate like we are, a week makes a big difference. Because I, I find uh, pole beans, you know, it takes them a certain amount of time to make the first bean, and then it will produce beans until frost. That's right. And this, if you start a week earlier, you have an extra week of beans. That's definitely a good. I mean, I, I plant bush and pole, and I get the bush, and then the yeah. pole sort of come in when the bushes are done. But if you were just going to plant one, and, and, and if you were just going to plant one, you'd want to plant the pole if you could get them started earlier because you just they just keep going and going and going. Yeah. That's a really good idea for that. Yeah, yeah. That, that worked fairly well. You know, it's again, it's, it's extra work and so on, but especially if you have a smaller garden, it's probably worth doing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, Robert, thanks a lot. I think we've uh, covered it fairly well today. Uh, it's been uh, great having you on the show. Uh, any chance we can have you back again? I'm sure I'll be around sometime. Okay. I'd, lo I'd love to be on the show again. Great. That's great.